right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on how to work across identities to build thriving teams. My name is Mariah, I'm calling in from Sapling and really thank you all so much for joining us today. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll be talking to HR, DEI and people operations leaders on how to build incredible teams that are inclusive of different identities. So as you're getting settled, we'd love to get the conversation started right away. One of the ways that we'll be interacting during this webinar is by using the chat feature in Zoom. And so throughout the next hour, we'll be asking you to go back to that chat to just really join the conversation and, and yeah, have a chat with us. Um, if you're looking for it, just go ahead and hover over your Zoom window. You'll find it in the lower right-hand corner. It should say chat. This conversation will only get richer and richer the more that all of you get involved. So we really, really do encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to join us. And as for starters, um, we'd love to get to know about all of you guys on the call today. Uh, feel free, um, if you could go in the chat box and go ahead and put in your name and where you're dialing in from, we'd love to hear. Oh, we've got people from LA, NYC. Hi, Julie, hi, Donna. <laughs> Miami, Oregon, Texas. Go, oh, the US card, amazing. Thank you guys, cool. So. Keep going with that, but also would love to know a little bit about what you would like to learn today. What do you guys all wanna know about working across identities? For anyone that is willing to share that, please jump in the chat. All right. Building effective teams, connection, conflict resolution, that's a huge one. Amazing. Cool, feel free to keep adding those. All right, before we dive into the official discussion, I wanna go ahead and quickly introduce the partners on the call today. Um, we'll go ahead and start with us over here at Sapling. We are a people operations platform that helps growing organizations automate and elevate their employee experience, really helping just automate the backend work, everything from onboarding through to offboarding. We also have Culture Amp here on the call. Um, they are a people and culture platform that try to make it really easy to collect, understand, and take action on feedback throughout the entire employee life cycle. And last but not least, we have our wondrous hosts. We have Think Human, um, their leadership development and manager training company that drives lasting change and habit formation in fast growth organizations. All right, guys, now I'm gonna go ahead and hand this on over to you, Anna. Um, as the facilitator at Think Human, who will be leading our discussion on cultural intelligence in the workplace. Welcome, Anna, and over to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We are so happy to have you here today. We have, from what I'm seeing, we have people registered from everywhere, so we're excited to have you. Um, we have an incredible panel of, of experts. Um, and they're leaders from high performance organizations. They're gonna be sharing their road tested experience and stories and they're gonna be taking your questions. So please, please continue to uh, post your questions. We also had questions that you all sent us beforehand. And, um, and it's all about how to work across identities to build thriving teams. Um, I uh, wanted to, let me move this out of the way so that I can actually see everybody. Um, uh, we've already gone some over some of the tech uh, things, but I also wanted to point out one thing. In your upper right-hand corner, there is a, um, a button that you can press that's a gallery button. That way you can see all the panelists. It's sort of like the Brady Bunch version. Of, for those of you who even know that reference, it's the Brady Bunch view of things. Um, so you can press that and, of course, the chat button. Um, so. I wanna to talk to you about the panel that we have. We have an incredible panel. Um, they've built award-winning organizations and they're here to share with you today. Um, they're gonna to be taking your questions. Let me introduce them to you. Um, we first have Julie Lee. Julie, you can wave. She is the VP for uh, People Stella Connect. We also have uh, Ken Matos. There we go. Ken is the Director of People Science at Culture Amp. We also have Rajkumari Niyogi, and they are the founder at iStart. And then finally, we have Lynette Barksdale, who's the VP of Diversity and Inclusion at Goldman Sachs. 
um, they're going to be sharing some uh, road tested experience and um, they've ranged from high, high like hyper growth startups uh, to multinational organizations uh, with tens of thousands of employees from all over. Um, and these panelists are really all uh, leaders at high performance companies. And if you haven't already done so, you should check them out at Glassdoor. They have really high ratings and they're doing something really, really special. Um, all right. So please get involved. We're about to jump in and, uh, and here we go. So first, I want to start with a broad definition. What is intersectionality and in what way do you define it? And we'll start with Ken. Thanks, Anna. Um, so when I think about intersectionality, I, it, you know, to be technical for a moment and then be more illustrative, um, it's the singular identity that emerges from all the other um, identities that comprise a person's experience. And I like to think of it like mosaics. So mosaics are made of lots of little stones. Individually, each one of them could be your racial identity, your sexual orientation, your gender, uh, your socioeconomic status. Together, they make up a singular picture that is more than the sum of its parts. And so intersectionality is recognizing people for that full mosaic, not just each one of those individual stones by itself. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Raj, do you want to add something to that? As I'm, as I'm listening to, as I'm listening to Ken, Ken, I'm just wondering, like something just popped in my head, <clears throat> which is, what about the shadow parts of ourselves that we're not aware of? <laughs> like what happens from that place? And so that was just a, a moment that, that popped up to me, popped up for me, but just really kind of, you know, looking at who we are when we show up in the workplace and how we decide what parts of ourselves to showcase in the moment, depending upon what's happening in the room, where the power is in the room and to some degree and to, to, to quite a large degree, how safe do we feel in that? Mm -hmm. Great. Why is this relevant to business? Lynette. Oh, absolutely. So hi, everyone. You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that we have found is that when we don't allow people to show up with all of the aspects of who they are, right, to really bring their authentic self to the table, we are losing out on some of the best parts of people. And so when you think about the workplace and when you think about, uh, when we talk about diversity, right, and we talk about diverse perspectives, those are the things that come out when we allow people to show up within all of the different intersections that they come to the table with. And when we isolate those or when we try to, as Raj said, hide some of those or when those can't come out, we're really doing people a disservice because they're not bringing their full creativity and innovation to the table. And that's something that we really have to be cognizant of as, the, as we continuously change and innovate within our products and with our so that is one of the things that I think is really important about the workplace and why intersectionality is so important. Mm -hmm. I also like the idea of the multiple identities, what kind of said it's in terms of the mosaic, because oftentimes when we see ourselves uh, or when we see each other, um, it's a lot about outer appearance. You, you kind of identify as one thing, but I think intersectionality is really about all of the different things. So not making assumptions with folks that you work with as well. I think that's really how it shows up in the workplace as well, um, is that being uh, being more curious about a person and, and everything that they come with and everything that's shaped their life experience that is influenced in a way that they um, make decisions at work, they collaborate, their communication style, all of those things and being curious about it and embracing all of that is also really important and not to put people in buckets. I think that's a very, very important part of uh, understanding intersectionality as well. Mm -hmm. And assuming that you don't see the full mosaic. Mm -hmm. So I think what we end up seeing is a fragment of it. Um, what, what the person can't hide, what they choose not to hide, what we're in a position to actually see because it's relevant to the moment. There's lots of aspects of ourselves that we could bring, but we don't because it's just not the moment for it. And so um, I think it's important to always approach it with a sense of there's always deeper waters here. Um, and some we can explore and some we can't, but just knowing that there's more there than what we see, I think sets up a better interaction with that. 
So what I'm hearing everybody say is that having people show up fully and, ex and actually being curious about that um, makes for a richer, more dynamic work experience all the way around. Yeah, I, you know, I want to kind of tug on a thread here that Julie said about curiosity. I think it's essential, right? But not everyone's curious and not everyone feels comfortable being curious because being curious is about asking difficult questions and, you know, maybe getting into some uncomfortable water. And we were just talking about this, you know, before the call, how do we start as organiza organizations and teams to really make it okay to have these uncomfortable situations um, and stand in that place of uncertainty, but keep asking these questions like, oh, I'm just, I really want to learn about you. Um, I really want to understand more of who you are and what you need in order for us to drive this business outcome. Well, that, so it, my next question relates to this a little bit is who leads a company's culture and who sets the bar as it relates to intersectionality at a company? Absolutely. I'll jump in here. I, I think, you know, we always want to go to the default that senior leaders own this, right? I think anyone who manages individuals, I think also anyone who just shows up to a company owns the culture, right? I think it is really important for us not to pinpoint that just one individual within a company, whether it be the person who owns diversity and inclusion, or whether it be the team whose primary responsibility is to recruit um, for diversity, right? We really should think about everyone as a culture carrier for, for inclusivity, right? I think that if we do that, then one, it takes the responsibility off of one individual, um, but it also then makes us all show up in a really interesting and unique way um, to make sure that we hold the torch and we're keeping it moving forward. So I think everyone carries it, but I also think, and you know, I d hate to use the word manager. I, I just, it's not a word that I love, but any leader, anyone who leads teams, they should be individuals who are really hold, held accountable to ensuring that everyone around them are following the right practices to make sure that we're creating an inclusive environment. Yeah, so I'm getting, yeah. Like Kathy Winters is I was just questions. about to say that, Raj. Yep. Yeah. How, how, what happens if people don't feel safe opening up? It happens every day, you know, at every meeting. And I think that's, you know, a, a very kind of rich and nuanced answer in a lot of different ways. But um, as we were talking a few days ago, I think in the, in the briefing, there's such a, a need to kind of bookend policy around inclusive environment and professional development and kind of unearthing the parts of ourselves that are you know, a little more reticent in showing up. And those two tracks um, really for me and what I talk about with leaders um, in consulting around culture is the way in which we create that level of transformation where people start to slowly and incrementally feel safe showing up. I, I actually think as individuals, we also have a role to play, which is to invite people to share. Um, as a very concrete example, I was talking to a colleague about a stressful experience she'd had and she just kept saying everything's fine, like five times in the, in the conversation. I was like, no, you're, you're trying to convince yourself, not me. So why is it not fine? Because clearly it's not fine. Mm -hmm. And then she told me a whole bunch of other stuff. And I was like, now we can do something about it. But I think it, it was very, I, I think she was trying to signal in a safe way that there was a problem. And it required my hearing that and saying, I actually want to hear what it is that's buried behind all these everything is fine statements in order to get to that deeper information. Mm -hmm. Josh, I want to pull a thread on that. But Julie, I'd love to hear more about what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I loved, I love where Lynette, Lynette was going around. We always think as a senior leadership team. And I think at, at a startup, quite frankly, uh, at a smaller company, the, the founders and the leadership team really do drive a lot of the initial culture. Right. If you walk into a company that has 10, 20 employees, you'll feel that the norms and the culture of the company really is kind of an extension of the working styles, communication styles, et cetera, of the founder. But Raj, I'm sure you see a lot of this working with a lot of CEOs and founders is that they also evolve as people. And that's why it's really important for us to also realize that we as individuals can influence the culture. 
right? It's not that it is set in stone. It's not that this person is born this way and then that's the way they, they think. It is absolutely not true. And that's why we all individually have power. We have power to change a person and involve them and involve the organization. So yes, it really does start with the founders, but it really also uh, continues with the evolution of every single person that comes into the room and comes into the conversation. Um, so I, I, I think we do need to recognize that we all have the power to do that um, and and to ask the tough questions like Kevin was saying and to and to help people realize we care about them as, as individuals um, and that will help open up some of the conversations as well too. So I've seen this question asked a few different ways in the chat and I want to ask this because we clearly see that this is something of value and that is something that we need to encourage people. All right so how do we train managers to effectively lead people with different cultural backgrounds? You know, for me, I talk about needs and feelings all the time. You know, my obsession, as many of you know, is, is epigenetics and neurobiology. And, you know, it, everyone on this planet, every single person, regardless of cultural differences, has a nervous system mm -hmm. and also two hemispheres. And at the end of the day, because we're all human for now, um, <laughs> You know, I, I, it, we have needs, we have needs. And when we look at organizational values, those in essence are needs that we want to feel that are being met in our day-to-day -day lives. And we have our personal needs, our personal values. And so, you know, really kind of looking from that place of understanding and tailoring the individual's needs. Like, does, a, does one particular person on your team really need to be seen and heard in meetings? Is that their thing? Versus where someone else needs to have uh, a sense of, of value and contribution, that they, how they're showing up really matters. And to communicate from that place. The other piece that I think is absolutely essential that we forget as organizations is that we spend a lot of time recognizing. We spend a lot of time in recognition. Uh, but what we, what we have, I think, lost a little bit of sight or, and not, you know, kind of exercised our muscle enough around is appreciation. And recognition and appreciation are two different parts of the brain. The recognition is the left piece and appreciation is the right piece. And I, I, I think when we do both, really, really well and masterfully, we start to actually shift the well-being of our employees and we start to notice how our culture by default begins to thrive. And I think that for me is key. Hmm. Yeah, Raj, I'm just, you know, I'm sitting and, you know, I love hearing you speak because it's so compelling. Um, and, you know, I, I really do believe that leaders are, when, when I think about our leaders and I think about in the many different spaces that I've worked, you know, most people, when I come to the table, they don't say, I don't want to do this Lynette, right? A lot of the things that I'm seeing in the chat is, well, how do you make them comfortable enough to do it? And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have to just admit to people and, you know, Ken spoke to this. So, you know, art, he articulated this in such an amazing way. So I may kick it over to you, Ken, in a second, just around really telling people how hard it is. Right. But then also letting people know that it's a, privilege to be in a space where you get to grapple with how hard it is every day to come to work and make these decisions about how you're going to show up for your people. And so really thinking about that and coming to the table to have that, you know, have that thought and conversation with yourself and then thinking about, then what does that mean for my people? Right. And, and, you know, I think Ken, you know, you had a really great point around this, but I think, you know, that is what we absolutely have to think about is how do we first put it on the table that this is going to be uncomfortable. And then start thinking about, great, but you're uncomfortable. Now think about the environment that you're creating or that is being created for the people that work on your team. Love it. Yeah, I think so much of that is we forget that leaders are people who've generally been successful. And then we're asking them to do something that they're not going to be continuously successful for. And they, honestly, they don't have the tools. Like, they, they, they have not often had enough moments of having to grapple with something, not being something they're a master of for such a long period of time that just getting them ready for that experience is such a key part of the process. I, I also like to emphasize a lot of the, the nitty gritty things we, we say, but we don't actually address. So like one word I hear a lot of in these conversations is time. But we never talk about time. 
Um, we want managers to do 5 billion things. Many of them are very emotionally threatening, but we don't give them any time to think about it. We don't give them any time to stop and say, wait, have I recognized everyone? They're too busy running from back to back meetings and then doing their emails in the evenings um, or on the weekends, which then leads to all the emails that they send to employees because they're too busy doing meetings in the week to actually respond to anything during the week. And so I think there's a lot of very structural things that are right there alongside the teaching and the, the bigger brain process. But if we don't cover them, people just don't have the resources to be able to address the, the higher issues that we're trying to get them to move towards. Ken, you're really making me think about workplace being a life-threatening experience. And I want to kind of dive into that on my own time, not here right now. But I just want to call out someone, Salette, someone wrote, um, productive safe spaces are not comfortable spaces. Oh my gosh, totally. <laughs> like, you know, um, how do we start to craft these um, really safe spaces that allow people to be in exactly who they are in the ways that they process information and show up and create the, the level of execution that they need for their team in a way that fundamentally works for them. And I think that is so key. Well, that's, I love that. Raj, you and I are in a mind meld because I was literally going to say the same exact thing. And under, I, I said this in our, our, one of our calls before, one of the things that is key in all of these discussions is the importance of um, emotional IQ. Is actually starting to have people understand that it's not just uh, a being really smart at or really adept at numbers and getting results. That's certainly important inside of business. But what's also key is being able to read and fully get and, and uh, be able to um, sense all the different ways that people show up on different levels on an emotional level mm -hmm. so that you can actually bring that out and bring out the best in people. It's just like what you were talking about, Ken, when someone was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And clearly, emotionally, that person was not fine. And being able to read that and draw that person out. Also, I, fine is not a feeling, just FYI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Julie, you were going to say something. Good is not a feeling, or great is also not a feeling. Yeah. Just, Julie, yeah. To throw that out there. I just, I just love the I concept, and this is so relevant for, for me today and what I'm working on is just bringing feelings to work. We often really are afraid of talking about feelings at work, and we're just, just having a conversation with someone about how, you know, half of our time feels like therapy, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's true. When you're working with individuals, and we you're working with people, like what Roger's saying, we're humans. Humans come with so many different, um, you know, aspects of, of being. And, and one of the very important ones is feelings. Um, and I just think, you know, back to the conversation about being dis being uncomfortable. And I think it's, it's important to let some folks stew in discomfort for a little while, because quite frankly, there are people that show up to work every day uncomfortable. That's just, you know, they walk in and they said, let me think about all the things I need to cover before I walk into the doors today. So all of the parts of my identity that I don't feel comfortable showing up as. And some other folks have the privilege of not having that feeling very much. So it's okay to push people on a little bit, you know, and, and, and let them know that this is a common feeling that a lot of other folks have. So let's create a space where people feel less of that when they come to work. Um, so I think it's okay to push people on that a little bit and bring some more emotion to work. You know, dovetailing with that, Julie, I, I love that. And, you know, for me, it, it brings up um, taking it back to intersectionality and our identities, um, different parts of us feel differently in a situation, right? And to really kind of stand in that paradox of being this really complex human being about, you know, I'm mixed race, I'm half white, half East Indian, you know, part of me feels maybe really comfortable in this moment of power. And then the other part of me is receding and feeling really scared and not wanting to show up fully. And so I'm literally straddling this experience while I'm in a meeting, giving a presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of, yeah, sorry. Uh, there are all kinds of questions in the chat about like, um, yes, how do we bring, how do we teach that? How do we address that? How do we, how do we bring that kind of, most organizations gather some type, but they're all talking about how do we actually teach this very thing that we're talking about to managers? I will say this as a shameless plug, Think Human actually has, a, like, it's not really a shameless plug, it's just what we do and what we recognize is that 
emotional intelligence. And, um, and that literally underscores everything. We have uh, presentations and workshops that specifically gear towards that, but also anything else we teach, we teach a piece of that before we go anywhere else because that is the foundation where the building gets built upon. Without that, you actually have nothing. Totally. I just, I want to do a shout out to Nextdoor. You know, we're having an amazing conversation this week and, you know, their focus is about kindness. I mean, wow, like that is so awesome that this is going to be a forefront value about culturally creating that level of inclusivity through respect, warmth, recognition, appreciation, and just being plain old kind. Yes. Yes. How cool is that? I think there's the concept of uh, diversity and inclusion education or training, right? And there's also this other concept of um, just story showing, storytelling, I'm sorry, that I find to be really effective. Something I did at a previous organization is organize a storytelling event, a narrative event. So if you guys have heard of the mock kind of storytelling, uh, uh, that kind of setup, but basically inviting folks to have a five to 10 minute monologue on their, any part of their identity. So I shared at the time, I was pregnant at the time and sharing how awkward it is to talk about your pregnancy at work and to bring that out because it's kind of a intimidating, how are people going to react? Um, and folks shared across the spectrum about their personal experiences. It doesn't have to, quite frankly, always start with the leadership. You don't have to get all your leadership team in a room and, and talk about this. A lot of times is have invite them to those conversations and have them start absorbing by a little bit of osmosis and learning and storytelling and if you have some brave folks in your organization that are willing to share their stories use those folks as the first entree into that kind of conversation um, so being able to uh, bring out different voices within the organization could be really really powerful and doesn't always have to be starting off in a very structured diversity and inclusion kind of training environment either Julie, I, I love this idea and, you know, it doesn't have to be structured, but this is one aspect of um, when I was doing DNI for a smaller company, uh, we actually did this during a leadership training. So before we kicked off around data, around kind of what the next steps around our diversity strategy, we actually did an exercise around storytelling. And it was all of the more senior leaders of the company. And just having them talk to their own peers in a way it allowed them to have the safety of, you know, is, is my direct report not going to really understand me or get me? You know, they have fears as well. And so having them in this space to tell these stories allowed them to create and craft that narrative that they could then take back to their teams. And the challenge was to find an opportunity, and we weren't going to dictate which one it was, but find an opportunity to where you can tell this story. And I had one leader come back to me and say, you know, by me doing this, my team then wanted to do the same exercise. And then we just had this one meeting where we were able to tell these stories and it just opened up this door for us to understand different perspectives and the intersections that people come to work with. It, it was, it's really fascinating about creating this space where people can actually practice storytelling um, and, and refine what that looks like for themselves. There's a question in the chat, Lynette, to, to Lynette and Julie. Do you think that storytelling, setting this storytelling up as a work-sponsored event with senior leaders and managers or all staff, do you see that? as a work sponsored event as something being yeah, I've seen that I've seen that in a lot of companies that I've worked at. Um, it, it's actually becoming um, one of the ways where not only are you helping to build a more inclusive culture, you're building kind of this culture where it's okay to show your different your different identities, right? And it's okay and it's valued. And by doing this and by doing this at a senior leader level and by taking time, I mean you all know when you take any leader out of their their job that they're doing, you know, their their nine to five job, right? You are those are dollars and cents and I do value that and believe in that but I think that value that comes with that is around retention and we also know when you have to hire new people on a team those cost dollars and cents as well right so so really you're really trying to I did the, taking that time is so valuable and I think you know I've seen it in many places and I think it's actually becoming more prevalent um, than it has been historically there are so many questions regarding there. People are, what I'm taking from the chat is that people are so hungry for ideas and okay, how do we do it? Do the senior leaders get involved? Is it something that's meant like people are just, it's lighting up the chat board about how to like, so this leads me to the next question, which is what are, what are a few things that, that we can do in an organization that has this conversation move forward on an organization. So obviously storytelling is one of them. 
what's another two or three things that we can do that actually has this um, be expanded upon, be something that um, brings that kind of humanity in that has people be seen more fully. I don't know if this is a relevant answer to your question, Anna, but you know, one of the things that uh, when I was running around doing build inclusive teams to different companies and different offices, um, I had my presentation jam packed with all of this research and science and I was geeking out on that. And then right when I introduced the topic of epigenetics before I even get there, I have everyone in the room go around and share a story about their their parents or grandparents. Mm -hmm. And during the, you know, the survey at the end, hands down, that was the most powerful activity. People connected. They didn't know that their mother was a nurse and that they were in World War II and their grandparents. And they just started to connect in this way. And I'm like, but my research is awesome. Like that, they didn't <laughs> talk about that. They just wanted to connect with each other. And I think, how can we start to let it be okay for us to share personal stories, um, transgenerationally trans even, um, that we can start to get to know each other and cross those boundaries, create that level of trust, bring down the walls of fear, and really allow each team to get to know themselves at a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like two pieces that we, we, at least two pieces we have to confront around getting the stories. Because I, I totally agree with Raj. People just want to share their stories. Like they want to be heard. They want to be humans. So the, the energy is already there. What we need to do is figure out ways to unblock it. Um, I think one piece of that what blocks it is the old school images of what a successful employee will be is often very intersectional and one set of intersections. So it's generally the straight white man who doesn't complain too much, who um, plays the party line, blah, 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 all the things that, you know, if you were asked, you know, what's the perfect employee, people would, would spatter out pretty quickly. I think getting leaders to tell their stories and say, like, how they are not lined up with that is super helpful. Um, there's a great uh, piece of research one of my colleagues was working on where she discovered that getting all these senior women mentors to talk to junior women and only talk about how they were now, how they were super successful now, and covering up all the awkward moments while they were getting to be successful only made them feel like they were inadequate. Um, had the exact opposite effect of bringing them into the room. But when, when those women said like, yeah, it was hard. The baby cried. I had to have this fight with my boss. This person was not as respectful of me as they should have been. They were like, oh yeah, I'm experiencing all that now. So now I see the path to where you are. And so I think that's one of the key things of the leadership stories is allowing people to draw the connection between who they are now and who they can be and that there isn't this great gap. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. I also think you need to find one ally who is willing to share first. And if you be, before you go into the meeting, I think a lot of people are, you know, a little trepidatious of, oh, how is this going to go? But there's definitely at least one person who is brave enough, or maybe you can convince them to be brave enough to be the first person to share. And I have to tell you, it is unbelievably effective to hear that first story of vulnerability. And as soon as you realize, wow, they're being so transparent, so vulnerable, they're spilling their guts out, or maybe it's just, you know, a really fascinating story that really creates the momentum and that creates and then invites this environment where more people are willing to share. So you don't, don't feel like, you know, we got 12 people in the room and 10 of them are a little bit iffy. It's okay. Cause if those two people start the conversation, you will find it very, very interesting how the mood turns really quickly. So just find the allies before you go into that meeting. I think that will be a really effective kind of tactical way to go about these conversations. Mm -hmm. Julie, I love that. And I was just sharing in the chat that that is something that I employ all the time is not only, you know, when I do activities, you know, I'm always kind of moving around the space to hear conversations, kind of hear the people um, that really have a viewpoint that, that they are open and willing to share. And then sometimes I, I quietly even tap people like, are you willing to share, right? Are you okay, comfortable with sharing? And, and we get those people who step up. And again, it just takes one. And it opens, it, it opens up the gates and people start to feel comfortable and, and that they can be vulnerable as well. So I love that. And, and definitely it is a tactic that I've employed. 
I'd love to hear a little bit more about when you've implemented these tactics, what kind of changes took place? What did you see happen? Yeah, so I saw, you know, for example, you know, I talked a little bit about the storytelling, but I think what this did specifically for one team is that this leader again took this back to her team and not only did her team really start to then tell their stories, right, but it created this environment within this team where they also started to unleash different feedback around what was happening, right? So now it's not just your story. Now you can start to feel comfortable talking about how you feel coming to work every day or the impact that this other person is having on your day-to-day -day, or even that the work that you're doing and, and how that kind of does not mesh with some of your personal values and then what does that mean, right? Then how do you show up, right? Because I think a lot of times we forget that you know when people work at a company you know everything doesn't align the way that we want it to always right like mm -hmm. that you can come to work do everything that is in line with every single one of your values um but that doesn't mean that that's not the right place for you it's just about a conversation so i think it really started to unleash these different conversations that were not had before and i mm -hmm. think that's the most important thing when we think about creating inclusive in environments and when we think about creating inclusive teams it's about having different conversations that we were not comfortable having before and then driving towards change, right? And then what does that mean after? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can pile on, on that answer. Um, one thing I saw was an improvement in collaboration. I think there was one question in the chat just now about how do you convince people to even start this conversation? And it's always like, what's the buy-in story, you know? And a lot of it is business performance. Quite frankly, one of the things that a lot of organizations struggle with is collaboration, cross-functionally, getting people to talk, you know, more of like the same language and shared goals. But as soon as people start getting to know each other and have a level of trust, no matter where in the organization they sit, you will find that conversations and, and, and communications will flow so much easier. That level of trust will enable people to really partner and feel like they're in it together. So when we started doing these more story show, storytelling sessions and, and being more visible about people's identities and experiences, it really opened up the floodgates for more conversation and work-related conversation as well. So when you needed something, you needed help, you didn't hesitate to ask people as much because now you feel like you have a little bit of a common ground. So that is really an incredible outcome of focusing on these conversations and on sharing people's identities at work. We're also seeing improvement in manager feedback scores, right? So as we can, as we see some of the storytelling and, and some of this vulnerability and these conversations opening up, then we're seeing that managers are not only increasing their feedback scores, but that we're seeing um, a lower difference in, a decreased difference in um, experience based on gender and on race, right? Because again, when you are building a leader that is, you know, has high emotional intelligence, is vulnerable, is accepting feedback, right? You are actually closing kind of this gap around people's experiences across the different intersections that they bring, right? Whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's sexual orientation, right? Like we are really starting to close that gap. And so I think that is something that we've seen evidence of, which is, was really exciting as well. That's great. I'm like looking at the chat and it's just like, like everybody's just like, let's just have a group. It's amazing what's going on in the chat. It's really, really wonderful. And I also want to, I want to illuminate something that, that we talked a little bit about before this call. And I want to actually put it on the map, which is we are in a transition right now where, as Ken was saying before, before it was really clear, you came into work, you cut off all different parts of our, you know, humanity, and you just came in, you were basically a drone doing your thing. And, and then you went home and then maybe you had like different feelings or whatever, but you didn't really have the full scope. You know, we're all talking about bringing the full scope of who we are to work. And that transition is an awkward transition. It's an uncomfortable transition. And what it requires is a, is a degree of vulnerability and, and comfort with discomfort. And so to speak to that gap and to speak to that liminal transition that we're all moving through collectively, we're all inside this conversation because we're all interested in how do we make that particular uncomfortable liminal transitional spot that we are moving to better. And so some people have asked in the chat, well, how do we convince or talk to or have people who are in a higher position or managers who are the, the decision makers, how do we convince them that this is an important and valuable thing to invest in and spend time in? 
that feelings are actually good. I, How do we do that? I think one of the first things is to understand them. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make in any sort of social movement is we present our argument for why there should be change. We need to figure out what their argument for change is. Mm -hmm. I once had somebody say he presented stats on why um, workplace flexibility would make their company more efficient and profitable 16 different times. And his boss shot them down every time. And he was like, tell me what the business case is. I'm like, the business case is the wrong answer for him. He doesn't care about the business case. He's probably reacting to some old school sense of, if you don't show up nine to five, you're not loyal. And why would I want to support those people? Mm -hmm. You need to talk to that piece of, of objection or you're just gonna go in a circle over and over again. Whereas other people are totally numbers driven. Like if you talk about feelings, they'll ignore you. If you say we'll get a fraction of a percentage increase in uh, productivity, they're all in. Like it, it really is about listening to what your leader says and does. Cause sometimes they say what they think is appropriate. The business case argument's usually a really easy thing to say, but after you clear all that out, there's two or three things underneath you're like, ah, this is really what I need to talk to. That's where you're going to move. I 100% agree with you, Ken. And I was just do, invited to do a training at a, at a tech company and um, you know, on leadership development and, and um, you know, inclusive, building inclusive teams and met the CEO for the first time. And the CEO said to me in our first 20 minutes of sitting down together, so what's the point of being nice to my employees? And at that moment, I was kind of taken aback because I didn't really have, have an answer other than the obvious one. <laughs> and so we kind of talked through and I asked a bunch of questions. I stepped into coaching mode and I was kind of like pulling on some core beliefs. And then I just basically said, when I got some more information and some more data, I said, every time you are mean to someone, you are shutting down the part of their brain that is making you money. And that CEO, CEO went, oh. Uh, and that whole shift of like, well, maybe there's value in being nice to someone. And that's fine. Like, that's how we got in with that person. And to Ken's point, it's exactly about finding that opening and then going right in. Yeah. I love that so much. It's so true. Some folks, you really have to start with that. And you start with, how do you feel about the business results right now? Are we knocking it out of the park or can we do better? How do you feel? Are you feeling like you're getting the most out of the team? And a lot of times people will share with you, you know, managing the team is a tough part of their job, right? Can they do whatever technical they can do with their eyes closed, but managing is really tough. And that's the entry into this conversation of great. We, we want to get more out of our team. We want them to be more productive, more effective, more collaborative, whatever it is that you all feel like is not working well. How do we start that so you start kind of the conversation from where they are you meet them exactly where they are and what are their top priorities and then kind of be able to talk through okay this is where the core of the issue is right that's kind of a symptom of what's happening but what is the core uh, and it probably will not be one conversation but through some evolution of conversations we'll get to that core and people will start realizing oh it is about the people it is about treating them well and, and knowing them more than just a service level. And Julie, I think what you're saying, which is so valuable for all of us, is that, you know, leaders need the same thing that we're asking leaders to do for the people on their teams, right? Like they need the same type of care. They need the same type of coaching and support. And when we set them up and when we set up our teams and our organizations to be able to do that, then we'll be able to draw out these things from them and have these conversations, but they need the same exact things. And I think that's so important to this point of, you know, I think they're fearful because sometimes we come at managers and leaders like, well, you should know this, or you should absolutely be doing this. And they don't know, right? Maybe they were, again, to an earlier point, maybe they were good at, you know, their core job and got, you know, promoted to become a manager, but that doesn't mean that they were taught how to lead a team and, and drive results through other people. And so we really have to take that on. Yeah, I think there's something important to be said to, um, we want, we want, you know, for lack of a better word, management to see us and hear us, but it also goes both ways. Yeah. We need to actually meet them and hear them and what's important to them and then speak to that. Like there's, there's all these different finding the gray in between all of these like right, wrong, black, white, um, your, you know, like 
like assumptions that we have about people all the way around and then breaking that up and seeing where we can find the connection point between us and other people. It's okay. um, I just, you know, to go back to my story, that person had been able to raise um, just about a hundred million dollars and was completely panicked about trying to make those goals and was sacrificing relationship, connection, leaving bodies in the wake just to make those numbers. And then realized as the company started kind of tanking a little bit that that maybe wasn't the best way, but couldn't really understand why. And so also having that person, that vendor, that consultant, that um, that resource to kind of share and notice and point out and help coach is crucial, especially for senior leaders, because they are alone in so many ways and they're doing so much. Thank you. There are so many. So Ken, there's like panel, there's a chat going on. And so I'm just going to bring it in. Um, the question is, Ken, can you talk about what to do once you have the results to an inclusion survey and how you use them and uses in all caps to move the needle and create behavior change? Because that's what we want, right? Ultimately is to change behavior. Absolutely. I think it depends on where you are in your journey. So if you're doing a starter inclusion survey that's to convince people that something is going on, then what you're really focusing on using the data for is being able to show both in numbers and in stories that there's multiple sets of experiences within an organization. Uh, one of my very large and traditional clients is just coming to the realization that there's a core group of people who've been here a long time, they have one really coherent set of experiences, they're also very similar demographically, and then once they start adding more layers of difference, they start seeing more and more different sets of experiences, and they have the stories that they put in the qualitative to say, yeah, it's like, uh, okay, I see there's a number difference. What does that number difference mean? Well, it means that they have this kind of experience. And so it really gives you the multiple angles to be able to talk through one of these persuasive conversations rather than um, getting stuck with, well, they're different, but what does that difference mean? Or here's a story. Is that story common? No, that's probably just that one person. Mm -hmm. um, I think once you've gotten to the point of like, wow, there are multiple companies all in the same building, that's when you start looking at it much more from a, what are the intervention opportunities perspective? Our platform helps you figure out some of the areas where you may want to focus, but it's really the, the place where you then say, all right, if this is what people are experiencing, how do we change it? And sometimes it's really blunt and sometimes it's really subtle. Um, that same client had a lot of conversation with people saying, you know, we want to be able to wear jeans to work. And they're like, that, that seems stupid. I'm like, wait a second, take a look at that matches up with like socioeconomic status, um, especially from the past, because you're a very traditional organization with a very clear dress code. And some people may feel really uncomfortable making the switch. And so maybe they still have to make the switch because that's what your industry requires. But that's a thing that needs to be coached and helped with. That's something your managers can lead some of these storytelling conversations how some of them made the transition from one SES to another and what that meant for them as people might actually make this much more smooth. And so um, I think what's really powerful is being able to say, if this is a common comment and if this is coming up in um, numbers we can then attach to performance, it, we have to deal with it. And it, we may not know how to deal with it off the, the bat, but starting the conversations and knowing their conversations worth having is really the most essential piece because then you can figure out what you need. Mm -hmm. You know, Kim, this is really great. And I, I think one of the other anecdotes that I'll share is that when I've been able to share these stories, the qualitative and quantitative data with leaders, they feel more confident going into a room and people say, well, why are we choosing to talk more about this intersection or, or this intersection? These leaders are like, 
Well, because I've seen the data, I've read the stories, right? So when you can give them this evidence, then they feel more confident stepping up and saying why they are making a decision or why they are investing in a certain group or in a certain position. Like they really feel like they are really equipped to make change and drive the change. And that is why this data is so important. And so I think to Ken's point, and I think a lot of you are asking this, if you are not doing these surveys, if you are not cutting this data um, to show the different intersections of people, then you are missing missing out on the real story of experience of people that may be marginalized or feeling oppressed in your organizations. Yeah, actually getting on getting a clear idea of where the company is at on terms of a map. You can't you can't if you don't know where you're starting from, you can never go to the place that you're shooting for. So you actually have to locate where everybody is uh, on the map to be able to then uh, chart your course. That's great. Julie, do you have any other thoughts about that? I'm just thinking, I think folks who are asking about the culture and platform, which by the way, I love. So I think it's a great platform to, to, to really dissect the data. So if you're a data person, like that's the way to go. The other way is if you don't have that available to you right now, it doesn't mean you can't get any data from, from your organization. And one of the things that is becoming more popular is stay interviews. So we oftentimes know eggs are interviews when people leave, we, we wanna know, but also why are they staying? So that's a great way. I think one person asked, you know, if their LGBTQ community is very small, we don't wanna single them out. It's having more of these conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations, or potentially if you feel comfortable, a little bit more of a small group focus group um, and, and asking people about their experiences. I think when you create that opportunity for people to share, um, that really brings out more than you may expect. So I think using that data, it's really, really powerful, whether it be in a survey form or whether it just be in a conversation. And of course, every, comp every company is different in terms of their level of transparency and data sharing, right? So also just knowing your company and whether or not people want to be completely anonymous in that, which I think is totally fine, or whether people will be willing to be in a group and share with other folks. I like the idea when there's more folks in the room because people realize they're not so alone. But again, test the comfort level of your own company, you know best. But I think trying to get those pieces of data to see who people, where people are right now and what we really need to pinpoint is an awesome place to start. Yeah. Um, I, I, someone just asked a question that I had as a follow-up. It was, once you have the data, what are the specific key skills you think you need to equip managers with with to handle this well. And that is actually my next question. Because I, I think, great, we now see, let's let's say the data points to that there's just a complete lack of inclusive, like it's just, we're not seeing people, people aren't happy, then what do you do? Where do you go with that data? And so my question, and someone's asking that is, um, if you could leave this community with one practical high leverage action, what is that? And I want everybody to answer that question. Well, I'm gonna jump in here and Martina Holmes is asking, how do you figure out the comfortability of your company? What a genius question. Um, I think for me, I'm gonna always go back down to the neurobiology of human experience mm -hmm. and to really kind of surface and understand what the unmet needs are and what are driving the feelings, the behaviors, the toxic environment based on those unmet needs. So I think how, for me, um, getting really clear on whatever the values that you're trying to embody as an organization, are those being embodied um, or are they just being dismissed and just really cool posters on a wall? Like what, what is that about? Um, and to really understand from a, from a very deep perspective, um, if these humans truly feel safe um, and if they don't, why not? Mm -hmm. what, what is happening mm -hmm. underneath the hood? And to really ask, to, I think also to become really um, masterful at asking questions that will allow the answers that you need versus will someone, would you recommend this company for someone in five years or will you stay here? Like th those, those questions for me, I'm not so sure that those are very beneficial, um, but more around questions around, um, do you feel safe speaking up in your team? Um, th things like that. Do you feel heard when you when you share your opinion? Yeah, you're talking about asking different questions, I'm asking, yeah, like exactly. better questions, more profound, deep, yeah, yeah, identity yeah. level questions. Yeah, and then and then and then actually listening from that spot. 
And then, you know, to, to both to Lynette and Ken's point, now what do you do with that data? Now that you have it, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. um, and do you have as a leadership team the skill set to actually move forward with that and make something happen differently than the, other than what's currently happening? Great. Yeah, and I would, I would say one actionable thing, and Raj, you know, thank you. And one actionable thing that I think is something that every person can do here is really figure out, do you have a mechanism to provide feedback to senior leaders, right? Is there a way that they can receive feedback? And if you don't, I would say that is one thing I would dig into, figure out, right? Because I think when it's just one person telling someone something, they really don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they find it hard. And, and I know Raj, you can dig into why they died. <laughs> sure, you can talk a lot about that. But when you have these stories or these mechanisms where you can provide this feedback to someone and then help them navigate it, right? Because I see a lot about emotional intelligence in the chat, which is something I firmly believe in. And I actually, um, when I did my prep call, this is one thing that we talked about a lot, right? I actually fundamentally believe that we can change how leaders um, are, are showing up and how we retain and create spaces where people can come to work and be their authentic selves if we can build emotional intelligence, um, greater emotional intelligence in leaders. I fundamentally believe that that is the, the game changer and everything that we are talking about because, you know, so, so I digress from what I was saying around the feedback, but feedback is very important. So go figure out if you have a mechanism. If you don't, you know, I would consult with someone who can help you find ways um, that you can help provide feedback to senior leaders or make sure that there is a process in place to do it. Mm -hmm. I just want to kind of add to that. I was having a conversation with Tyler Muse from Lingo Live forever ago, and we were talking about how to operationalize self-awareness. And I thought that was such a fascinating concept. Like, let's figure that out together. And, and yeah, so I just kind of throw that in there. <laughs> I, I'm writing that down. That's brilliant. Okay, I want to get at, we're almost done. I want to make sure that I get everybody's voice, Julie or Ken. Um, I'll jump in here. I think just to reflect back on something earlier that we we're talking about around uh, the power to make a difference. I don't think that we should feel that we're one person and it's really hard to tackle. This is a very grand, huge topic. Uh, but I think one of the things that's been really effective at, at organizations I've been, I've been at is also harnessing a group of people with the same passion for this topic, just like the group that we have here. But I know there's other people in your organizations that feel equally so. Um, and a lot of times the grassroots efforts of an employee group can really drive change. And I have seen that actually happen at organizations. So don't be afraid to be that person that slacks out or sends an email, however you all communicate, uh, you know, you want to start a storytelling event or you want to start something that prompts discussion and learning um, and people can choose to join you in that. So don't be afraid to use that power that you have to start a movement at your organization. Mm, that's great. I love that. Don't be afraid to start a movement. Ken. So I have two suggestions. One is talk to leaders about these issues when you don't have an agenda. Um, I think we, we too often go into these conversations as here's the first time I present it to you and here's what I want you to do differently. And it's just, it's too much. And then we get, we get disheartened, they get frustrated. I think there's more room when, if you're having an ongoing conversation with them that eventually heads into an action rather than starting with, here's the action thing I need you to do. Um, especially since they're going to have their own feelings about a lot of this. Um, finally, I think the, other piece is make a list of the um, things that block people from participating in the initiative. Uh, one of the things that I find that a lot of uh, these things end up being like is uh, you're trying to drive the boat forward at full speed, but there's like five anchors hanging off the back of it and it just tears the thing apart. Mm -hmm. um, so do people not have enough time? Is there really aggressive goals that makes everyone scared of, you know, listening to any other possible way. Is punishment for failures totally out of proportion with um, the, the risks of these sorts of ende endeavors? If you can't acknowledge and address those, all of the training that we're, we're suggesting will ultimately fail. And that's where we have the, the tension we always see of like, but we did all the good things and somehow they didn't take root. Mm -hmm. That I think is the reason why 
doing the right thing doesn't ultimately reap the rewards we hope for. So I think a key thing is being able to look, make sure you have fertile ground for all these other really valuable and powerful experiences to, to take seed. That's great. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to, with my very scratch written notes, try to encapsulate everything that I heard that are steps forward. It is, first, we recognize that managers have needs and that we need to tailor our conversation to those needs so that they can actually start to think in terms of, oh, that works for the company, that works for everybody, and so that we have buy-in that way. We spend entirely too much time on recognition and not on, on appreciation. So we actually start to need to, we need to start focusing differently. Um, we uh, need to recognize that leaders um, don't have the tools necessarily. And so that we need to actually be a little bit more patient and speak their language and meet them where they are and then actually bridge that gap between where we are currently and what needs to be moved. Um, we also, uh, someone was talking about in the, in the chat about uh, journaling. There's also an idea about uh, bringing in really interesting events such as uh, storytelling. Uh, we need to start bringing emotionality and the full scope of who we are as humans into the conversation of business. Um, and, um, and I love what Julie also said, be courageous, be vulnerable, start a revolution. If you've got a passion, find other people in your company that have a passion and then go from there. Um, and then present to leaders in a way where they can hear it. Because if you come in and it's the first time and they can't, then the whole entire thing goes, to, like you have to actually start tilling the ground. And so I hope that those were some of the things that um, lead you forward. I wanna say a couple of things before we go to wrap up. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, each of the panel members for bringing your particular experience, your depth, your, your, your voice, everything. It was just an incredible conversation. Thank you to our community. Thank you to everybody who was on the call in the chat. Um, there's an adage that says that uh, culture um, eats strategy for breakfast. We want to do the exact opposite thing. We want to start feeding culture so that culture starts to build upon what it is our goals are. And Think Human is at the forefront of that. And we are thrilled to be having these conversations. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>